For those that are just coming in, please do say hello in the chat. We love to see uh, all the folks that are joining us from all over this gorgeous country uh, that we call uh, Canada. And we'll begin with an acknowledgement of, of the territories. So we at Help Seeker um, obviously are, are from all over Canada as well. And so doing an acknowledgement with just, just one territory wouldn't do us much justice. So for us, uh, we live across Turtle Island in what is today known as Canada. And as a company that's rooted in this country, we acknowledge all the places that we call home. I'm joining you from Mokinsis, aka Calgary today, uh, but we all uh, are across territories that have deep ties to Indigenous peoples and um, folks that have stewarded this land since a long before us settlers um, came to call it home. We also, in our work, always acknowledge and keep front and center that acknowledgement around colonial uh, institutions and the actors that perpetually have denied Indigenous people their rights to self-determination and sovereignty and through our work take that on as uh, as part of our uh, space and reconciliation and our contribution to reconciliation as well and I and I know you do as well so uh, let's get into the agenda but first, a little bit about us, so you know who's talking to you. So I'm Alina, I'm the co-founder at Help Seeker Technologies. And just if you are wondering why this company um, that does technology and data is talking to you about social issues, we uh, exclusively focus on, on social innovation and we bring technology and data solutions, social innovation to help resolve complex social issues. We work across the country. We have a team of about 50 or so uh, different kinds of uh, skill sets, engineers, all the way to data scientists, all the way to systems change and social innovation experts. And what we um, play with in terms of data is, is going to be something that we're going to be chatting about uh, today. But I think that the value add that we bring to this conversation is that we have a, a technology angle to our work. And um, we get to see communities from coast to coast because we're embedded in, in that work as well. So we are most definitely interested in, in hearing from your insights as well. Uh, but uh, definitely um, would love to also highlight our contributions and learnings in the last three years since we started up as well. So let's get into the agenda for today. I'm happy to jump in here if, if you want to sure. hand over. Yeah. Uh, Lindsay, just confirming we're recording just to let everyone know as well. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So we're going to just do 25 minutes of me talking here for a little bit, and then we're going to go move to the panel discussion with Mayor Gondek and Mayor Lehman, and then we're going to do an open forum. So we encourage, if you'd like to jump in, if you want to turn on your camera, you just need to ask permission from us and we can turn that on. So first we'll talk a little bit about social infrastructure in Canada, as well as the shifting mandate of municipal governments. And then as promised in the invite, we are gonna do a review of new social infrastructure data that Help Seekers collected and uh, visualized and analyzed over the last several weeks. So I'm just gonna move my screen. So as Lena mentioned, we're a social, tech social technology company that focuses on data. So over the last few years, we've partnered with CMHC and we set out to map all of the organizations, programs and services across Canada that support uh, community safety and well-being. And we've gone beyond just sort of nonprofit and charitable. We've tried to take a fairly a broad lens. So when I say social infrastructure through this report, I mean, or through this presentation, I mean the, the crunchy pieces like housing and educational facilities and parks, but I also mean all of those other community well-being supports that exist in your ecosystem. So today we've collected data of over 100,000 organizations, programs, services across 2,000 localities. So for the smaller localities with us, we haven't forgotten about you. I'm going to show you data for, from both large and smaller communities. What's the most sort of um, perhaps important or interesting statistic for us is through the collection of uh, those organizations, programs and services, we've also amassed the largest qualitative data set on social infrastructure in Canada. So today our data set totals about 6.2 million words. Over the next two years, we're expected to reach about 10 million words. Why that's important is because some of the advancements um, we've made in data analytics, specifically through natural language processing, our ability to 
create really detailed pictures of what your local service continuums look like is unprecedented, which I want to show you. But I also want to link back to why this data is so essential as we see the shifting, shifting mandate of municipalities. Finally, in this, this 50 plus integrated data set note is about We've also made advancements in our ability to take other data sets, table states data sets that you'll be familiar with, uh, census, CRA data sets, and layer that onto our mapping data to glean new insights about not just what organizations exist, but what kind of financial investments or what kind of indication of demand for social supports we're seeing across the community. So what have we found? We've mapped 100,000 organizations, which I'll continue to reference, but we've also started mapping as part of the supply, the supply being everything you have in your social infrastructure. We've traced 380 billion uh, annually into social sector spending. And, and that is honestly just a fraction of it. When we look at true infrastructure dollars, we expect that to, to double. At the same time, we're seeing worsening well-being and safety outcomes. And across communities, we're seeing what I think we would all sort of agree as inexcusable social inequities. So when I present this information locally, I always say, I'm not here to suggest that this is too much. I'm not here to suggest it's too little. But I think what we do need to ask ourselves, particularly post COVID heading into an economic downturn, is are we collectively getting the value we want from these investments? And we being everyone in this room, but also the, the residents of, of across the country. So do we need more? When we look at something like the opioid crisis or the housing crisis, probably. When we look at some of the geographic inequities and in infrastructure between rural and urban cities, absolutely. I think there are areas we certainly need more infrastructure. But my question is, what exactly do we need more of? And where do we need more of it? And for who do we need more? And if we need to resource that, again, heading into perhaps a national financial hardship, where do we have too much? And where can we start to think about uh, reducing some of our duplication of services and directing it towards some of the urgent gaps that we know exist? And so one of the um, challenges, I think, when we think about answering those questions is because the social safety net or social infrastructure across the country is becoming so complex, more and more complex every day with more and more resources, one of the, the barriers is we don't have great visibility into what already exists. So we're not able to make those intentional adjustments. So this is a, a slide I always use. It's dumb, but I haven't figured out a, a better way to articulate it. So if we think in the middle of social infrastructure as a Rubik's cube, every decision that's made, and in a large infrastructure, there are many, but in a small infrastructure, there are decisions made every day by individual actors and informal groups about new funding and new programs. Consider that a twist of the Rubik's cube in an effort to, to solve the puzzle. And I don't mean to be glib, but the puzzle truly is community well-being and safety. So when we're making these twists, hoping to solve for community well-being, we're doing so without being able to see the full puzzle. So we may be looking at part of it, we may be looking at one side of it, but if we can't see the whole thing, we actually can't make intentional adjustments to our social infrastructure because we don't know what's there. All, level, all levels of government face this issues. I've been in multiple meetings with provincial governments and departments of federal governments who freely admit that they don't have a clear indication of what exists on the ground. But municipal governments, I think with new and expanding or also municipal expanding mandates, but municipal governments with large infrastructure, I think have similar challenges into really understanding what's there. So when you're asked to add new programs, you're asked to add new services, you're asked to respond to encampments, to advocate for government for new funding, to defund or deep task the police, you're left doing so without a ton of visibility or intentionality into what you have too much of, what you need more of, and how you're going to fill the gaps. So the question we ask ourselves, but we're uh, also asking you is, is, can we reduce some of the complexity in social infrastructure planning by increasing the visibility into what's there? And then how do we perpetually and frequently measure what you have in your supply versus what your community needs now and what it's expected to need? And we don't have good mechanisms on a broad base, but also in many municipalities to incrementally measure how our community demand for social services or social supports are changing. That's made more complex by very fast growing communities. And so there's an opportunity, but I think we're on a bit of a precipice to see if we can get ahead of some of this um, social infrastructure planning. Okay, so this brings me to you. 
So at the start of 2022, these adjustments or these twists or corrections to address urgent social need, I thought were happening at 100K. And I think there may be some of you on the call that I had this conversation with. So as populations reach 100K, I thought that's when we started to have to make these infrastructure decisions and the complexity of the infrastructure would grow. I've met 40 plus, 40 plus and counting municipalities in 2022. And there's communities as small as 10,000 people who are starting to make these same adjustments to their infrastructure without full visibility into what supports exist what people need and what people will need. And again, even at 10,000, population of 10,000, you do have informal groups popping up to address social issues. You have neighboring municipalities who are serving your residents and you have funders, including private donors making decisions you can't see. And that's happening across the spectrum regardless of um, how large your community is. So I'm honored so many of you joined us and I, I was fascinated to see the huge range in size and communities and, and across the country because I believe you are facing some commonalities as we see this shifting social mandate. And uh, of course, I'm, I'm not the expert, so I'm looking forward to hearing more from Mayor Lehman, from Mayor Gondek, and also yourselves about maybe what some of those commonalities are and how we can address them together. Okay. I'm gonna just spend three, three or four minutes on why I think post COVID or during COVID, what are some of the changes we saw that have forced, I think perhaps an accelerated shifting mandate and municipalities? I'm gonna speak broadly and I would like to hear whether this is resonating from you. But first we'll start with increased visibility of social issues. So without a doubt, we saw an increased visibility of homelessness, also true homelessness. We also saw increased complexity of mental health, increased police pause, uh, calls. What this did was push social issues into uh, a public consciousness and also a media consciousness that was driven and also caused by the public consciousness about social issues. And, and we started tracking Google alerts lately last year and the number of Google alerts that accelerated about food, poverty, calls to local government to address social issues, um, encampments, job loss uh, grew significantly. The result of this was a public pressure at the local level. So, and I, I'm, I'm sure you all know this, but it created this political pressure at the local level because at the end of the day, the voters don't care about government mandates. They don't wanna hear that it's actually the province who has to inject money in for permanent supportive housing. They don't wanna hear that opioid addiction or opioid treatment uh, needs to be dealt with at a different level of government. So had a lot of municipal governments sort of left holding the bag say, how do we res respond to urgent community needs? How do we support our community without the mandate or the resources to do so? What we're seeing from a, a political science standpoint as well is we're seeing more and more individuals over attribute the level of influence that their government has and that's expected to continue. Also seen an ideological shift in municipal voting, voting behavior. 10 years ago, uh, and I haven't done the math, but I would love it if someone did, how many municipal campaigns did we see that were centered around social issues? This year, we've had a swath of municipal campaigns and social policy is, is at the forefront and this indicates to me that this question about municipal mandates isn't going to go away and nor should it because obviously the well-being and safety outcomes of our residents should be paramount and social inequities should be prioritized but if this is going to continue to be a focus at the political end of it and the voting end of it then i think we need to look carefully at the administrative and the functional capacity of our local governments to address these social issues because soon we're going to see a, a fracture in the amount of uh, energy and focus and commitment on the political end and then the actual administrative capacity to deal with it and i would argue in in some areas we've already seen that next we have new municipal precedent so there are local governments, so yourselves included, who stepped in and said, okay, we need to do something. We're not getting the support we need from levels of government. We're going to put money in. We're going to put resources. We're going to put people on this issue. They've set a precedent not only for their own local government, but they've also set a precedent for the communities around them. And I've had conversations with, with some degree of, of trepidation where neighboring municipalities are starting to dip their toe into building their own social response. And that's leaving other municipalities to say, well, what are we going to be doing next? And, and what's our role in our community? In some regards, though, I think this is inevitable because when we saw Ontario make the decision to legislate community safety and well-being, specifically at the municipal level, despite you know there being other mechanisms within the province to distribute uh, social funding, 
what we saw after and what we're continuing to see in our sentiment monitoring is community well-being pop up in different provinces and different areas, almost like a wave. East Coast, I haven't seen it yet, but I'm, I'm curious in six months time, if we had this conversation again, to what extent those themes with the municipality at the center of that accountability are, are gonna be um, popping up. The final thing I'll say is the sort of blurring of lines. And this is, we're seeing these squishy lines between what the municipal government can and is willing to address and what the provincial government can see, what they wanna intervene on, what they want to address. And then there's huge differences across the country, as you know, about what level of, um, not control, but what level of input the province wants. So we even have some provinces talking about downloading social to municipalities. And that brings its own questions about what should be downloaded, how should it be downloaded. All of this to say, I think one of the pieces that's missing in order for us to navigate some of these pieces is actual visibility. Uh, across all levels of government on what we have to meet our community well-being needs. So the challenge, and again, I, I don't think I have to explain the challenge to you, but I'm going to spend a minute. So every municipality has a limit to your mandate, your capacity, human data, technology skills, and also your social purchasing power. So we conduct social impact audits all across the country, and that's measuring the total amount of money that's going into a social safety net. When we do that, we consistently find that municip municipalities put in two to 6% or, or control, if you will, two to 6% of the inputs into the social safety net. I'm aware there's people on this call who have 0% of the social purchasing power. Well, why does that matter? It's inevitable that your social infrastructure is gonna become larger and more complex and there's gonna be more dynamics. I'm not saying here the point of this is not to say you need to go get control of the other 95%. I'm saying if the pressure for municipalities to address social issues is going to persist and increase, the municipalities have to be creative and intentional about what role or value you're going to add to that system, knowing that you can only truly, truly control your two to six percent. There is, though, I think good precedent across the country in some of the larger municipalities and the growing municipalities of how municipal, municipalities can play more of a, a facilitation, a coordination, and a convening role. But that's something that needs to be declared intentionally, and there needs to be a roadmap on how you're going to build the capacity to do that. So my final slide here is, is just a few ideas, and I want to quickly show you the data before we move to the panel. I'm going to talk about a couple of these that I think are most important. What can a municipality do? So invest in social infrastructure data. I'm biased, I'm gonna show you the social infrastructure data, but I truly, without kidding you, think it's such a foundational piece of what we're missing in these conversations. Don't allow conversations in your community or decisions in your own local infrastructure to happen without visibility and intentionality. So going back to my Rubik's cube, make sure other actors in your system, if your social safety net, other levels of government are making intentional decisions about what you have, what you need, and what you anticipate your community will need. And the best thing you can do is invest in that data and bring it forward to the other actors so you're having um, evidence-based discussions. Next is technology. So you will be hindered or hampered by technology and it because it's, as we know, so crucial in driving data, not only on what you have, but also the outcomes and community needs. When we talk about the advent of smart cities, for example, well, to me, a smart city is one that, one that is able to go beyond this sort of mismatch of social technology we have in communities and invest in something that's actually going to, at writ large, measure how we're doing from an outcome standpoint. So I would say one thing a community can do is, if you're able, is invest in the digitalization of your social safety net and advocate for other levels of government to do so. Coordinate investment planning. So if you have 5% of the pie, what's your ability to convene the other 90% to have intentional conversations around infrastructure planning with data and evidence? And particularly, I know the mayor's associations, I can see a couple on the call. How are you using that provincial level picture and the differences between what's in each community to take back an evidence-based perspective to the provincial governments or federal governments to say, hey, here's where some of our gaps are and we can show you on paper specifically where they are. Two more for my planners in the room. I haven't forgotten about you. So zoning and bylaw reform. So with the increased public consciousness of, of homelessness and, and social issues, it's undoubtedly increased NIMBYism. And, and to some extent it's fair. 
um, because we've seen economic loss and we've seen perceived and real threats to uh, safety. This poses a huge challenge to scale your infrastructure. As those feelings of nimbyism uh, grow and increase, your ability to put in the real community well being and safety supports you need will be limited. There are clever ways, and we've worked with a few municipalities on this, but to kind of balance that risk mitigation and individual and community well being. But it helps to have that foundation of data to have evidence based discussions about what's needed and where. Finally, and I know I already talked about this, but the facilitate, coordinate, and convene, I wanted to reiterate. I, I'm not saying all municipalities must or should lead from the front, and you may have entities who are doing that well, and, and that's not necessary, but what I do know is municipalities can't go it alone. So I think what, what we're advocating for again, and I keep using this word, is an intentionality and in what role you play. And for some, that may truly be uh, the municipality needs to take leadership in facilitating and coordinated and convening to bring stakeholders together to build almost like a shared asset approach. When we look at municipalities and we talk, to, uh, talk about asset management planning, what does that look like if we broaden our definition of assets and look at community-owned assets, specifically for social infrastructure, and what role can everyone play in ensuring that's healthy and effective and meeting the needs of the community? The biggest piece of that, I think, is how can the municipality support building joint responsibility and accountability for well-being outcomes across the whole infrastructure, regardless of where you sit. So I'm going to stop the presentation here. We had, oh, 225, did pretty good. I'm just going to show you a couple uh, pieces of the new data set, and then I'm going to turn it over for the panel. Okay. Can you see my screen? Not quite yet. Okay. <laughs> now, oh, we, now we can. Awesome. So I pulled up a couple of screens to make this easy, but this is kind of our digital platform. And on the first screen, we have this for 2000 localities across the country. What we're able to do is explore here. I have Ottawa. I don't know if I have any Ottawa people in the room. Some of the community organizations within your city and we've plotted it geographically. We're also able through our kind of uh, version one tagging system, we're able to explore these infrastructure pieces by theme. The next screen I'll show you though is a deeper dive. And when I talk about making uh, intentional decisions about social infrastructure, but also when I talk about advocacy, it really is this level of information you need uh, to be able to compare yourself to provincial averages, to other community averages, and build those cases for support. So what we're looking at here is specifically housing and homelessness. We've taken that 6.2 million word data set and we've been able to use natural language processing to mine it, to find all of the different pieces in your housing continuum. Here I'm showing you Ontario. We do have this at a local level. We have housing and homelessness, mental health and addictions. We're working on domestic violence. We'll soon have food. And the idea is we continue to add these chapters to the database to, to build a, a more robust picture. The most obvious thing, and it's no surprise to anyone in Ontario or across the country, is we are probably over leveraged as far as our housing continuum goes in emergency based services. When I look at Ontario level data for, oh, it's going to reload on me, for permanent supportive housing, for example, or any of the pieces we know are necessary for the prevention or addressing uh, chronic homelessness some of the prevention pieces, addiction streaming, as a proportion to the rest of the sample, there's far less than you would hope for as far as a healthy continuum goes. This next screen is similar and we're gonna use Ottawa as an example, but it dives into population. So when I continuously reference the um, demographic-based inequities we're seeing as far as well-being outcomes, looking at what services serve which populations helps us to understand maybe why we're seeing some of the inequities in, in homelessness or mental health that we are. It also allows us to see on a map. Here. So I'm able to go to Ottawa, population detail, and I'm able to filter all of the housing categories here by population. And typically, you know, you see demographic, gender, 
what we've pulled out from our unstructured data is actually 350 populations based on age, gender, family status, and we can manipulate this data to understand what aspects of the social uh, service system or social infrastructure are responding to which demographics. This third example here, let's see what I have. This is really interesting. So what I wanted to look at was specifically in, in Vancouver. I don't know if I have any Vancouver people. Again, the housing and homeless continuum. When I look at the full housing continuum, not filtered by youth, I do see things that you wanna see uh, like pre and post addictions treatment. I wanted to understand youth specifically to see what kind of uh, recovery-based housing, recovery housing-based programs existed in Vancouver. And this is just city of Vancouver, not Metro, I will add. But here we can actually see a lack of recovery-based services and housing. This to me is the type of kind of gem or finding that you would then use in conversations with the province or in even conversations with uh, other funders within the locality to say, this signals we have a gap, how do we fill this in? This is the third and final thing I wanna show you. So when we talk about social purchasing power of municipalities, but when we do our social, um, social impact audit, we look at all the sources. So we look at beyond just charitable, but this um, innovation, basically what we've taken is a CRA data set and we've applied our classifications and our continuum. So what's called an ontology, but it's a way to filter or understand programs and services that's far more accurate than has ever existed in Canada. So we've applied these classifications to the charitable data set. And this screen helps us to understand across particular issues, just looking at the charitable funding, what percentage is the municipality contributing relative to other levels of government? Because again, it helps you to understand what your social purchasing power is. Interestingly though, when I pulled up Ottawa and I pulled up Nanaimo here, all mental health and addictions, you'll see similar to our areas of concern before. And I pulled up Oh, it changed to Ottawa. So I pulled up Wood Buffalo. The percentage that each municipality is contributing, although massively different because the social infrastructures are, are ranging from very small to large, is all around six to eight percent. So what's interesting is we're seeing these similar themes. So how can we take some of this information and bring this forward to provincial governments or other donors, United Ways, private donors within the community? to say, here's where most of our funding is going, but we know that here's where our gaps are and how can we together work to coordinate some of this funding to funnel it in to, to fill the holes that we're seeing. Awesome, um, so I'm happy to spend as much time as anyone would like uh, offline. I can walk you through some of your local data. It's a lot of data to process, so I can give you a bit of a, a more specific demo, but thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Jesse. And uh, even, even though everybody loves data, uh, what we like more is the stars of our show today. So uh, the two mayors that we have here today have uh, agreed to weigh in and uh, tell us what they're seeing on the ground and the, the trends and um, perspectives that they bring from their two respective cities. And I wanted to open it up to uh, both of you. And I, and I know um, Mayor Gondek also has a, an emergency council meeting at uh, in about 40 minutes or so. So I'm, I'm going to go with ladies first, only um, in respect to the emergency, <laughs> not because of gender bias. So uh, Mayor Gondek, if you want to kick us off, and then we'll go to Mayor uh, Lehman. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and I appreciate setting this up for success by demonstrating what the, the data is showing us. I have to say that as municipalities, I would probably say that most of us don't have this level of sophistication um, of data available to us. Um, I think one of the things that happens in municipalities and governments writ large is that whereas the tech sector has rapidly advanced and permeated every other industry so that we can get the type of evidence we need to make strong decisions, we're still sitting with IT departments that are really good at troubleshooting why my windows isn't working or whatever it happens to be. So access to data, I would say, is probably one of the biggest things that would give us a greater ability to make strong decisions and to advocate on behalf of our residents as well. And so I think uh, municipalities need to get much stronger at getting out of traditional procurement models and get much better at understanding how benefits-driven procurement means seeking out the people like help seekers or other organizations that have this kind of data that's gonna help us make decisions. So that's sort of a, it's kind of a structural systemic thing that I'm observing. 
Um, you made a comment about how local governments stepped in to solve problems. Um, probably none so big for us as having to make a decision on what to do about COVID and transmission. That was uh, probably the defining moment where our local government said, you know what, if you don't wanna make a decision as the public health authority provincially, we're stepping in and we're gonna mandate masks wherever we can. And that was, I call it a defining moment because we did it and it helped and it got us into a better position than we would have been if we had simply waited for somebody else to make the decision for us. And I think it showed us, okay, all these years we've been sitting back and only following the, the exact jurisdictional things we should be doing, that allowed us to blow everything up. And from there, I remember bringing a motion forward saying, um, if the provincial government is not gonna strike a childcare deal, we'll do it. Let's just do it directly between the federal government and the local government. And everyone went, you can't do that. And I said, I don't know, maybe I can, maybe I can't, let's try it. I think the pandemic sort of broke us out of our fear and our mold, and it made us be a lot stronger in advocating for what we needed. I think probably coming, and I keep talking about the pandemic, but I think we need to because as horrible as it has been, it's also been a big opportunity to see where our strengths lie. The other thing that we came out with is that our city is best positioned to be a convener rather than a problem solver. And so there was a couple of pretty bold moves that we made. Um, one had to do with public safety and public well-being. And how do we how do we really address this issue of I used to feel unsafe in certain areas, or I used to feel uncomfortable in certain areas, and now I feel unsafe. How do we go from being uncomfortable to being unsafe? Is it just perception? Is it just in my head? Or did something actually happen? And when we convened about 24 organizations that are either situated in the downtown area or serve um, either position or people in positions of vulnerability or they have a very specific mandate that you know intervenes in these things everybody said the same thing there, there was some sort of a tipping point and it wasn't just that because downtown had cleared out with work from home orders that we were seeing things on the street that we hadn't seen that property owners who typically didn't have to deal with vulnerable people were seeing it in their lobbies. It wasn't just that there seemed to be more. And the thing that we landed on throughout all of those conversations is the street drug supply and the toxicity and the reaction of users, how people will become um, just violent and detached. And so when you start looking at problems from different perspectives, you not only wake up to the fact that things are very complex and wicked, if you will, but that you also need a lot of collaboration between organizations that traditionally haven't worked well together. And so um, our police service is a great example. I remember in uh, 2018, 19 and 20, when we were talking about how do we allow the police service to do their job instead of all the other things that we've added to the plate and how do we help them better coordinate with other organizations and some of my colleagues turned it into, you know, it's an attack on the police. And we got into the defund versus defend polarization. I think that polarization has just gone so far that we can't seem to get back to that central place where we need to work together and tackle these problems from, you know, a bigger, a bigger angle. And I think we got stuck in that polarization for the two years of the pandemic in a way I've never seen before. And I feel like I'm being rambly, but I'll just go down this little path here. People ask sometimes, um, what was the biggest surprise when you became mayor? I would say the biggest surprise for me is the persistence of polarization and the persistence of anger. And what we've tried to do is bring more of those opposing groups together so that the anger dissipates and people realize that they can be working together. And we've encouraged people not to just don't buy into the headlines, don't buy the hype on social media, come and actually have conversations either like this or in person in a room where you can listen to the reality of others that are going through something similar, maybe from a different perspective. Um, you talked about provincial governments and their role. We've had a tough go. Um, we've had a tough go with a government that just announced a $3.9 billion surplus yesterday. 
Uh, and I can tell you that we are in chambers right now that the meeting that I have to get back into, we're hearing from our fire department that they are, they're under equipped, they're understaffed, and now they're over overburdened with medical calls. We just had a three year old have to be rushed to the hospital in a fire vehicle two days ago because we had no ambulances on the scene. So we're in a very difficult place um, in Alberta with a provincial government that cut things so deep to demonstrate fiscal responsibility that it's gonna take a little bit of time to get back to where we need to be. I am hopeful and optimistic and also a little bit cautious that we might be able to participate in that surplus as a local government by tapping into some of the threads that you have all been pulling on. Where can we as a municipality help with housing? Where can we help with mental health and addiction supports? Where can we help with all of these other areas that we need to have in place? And if you create a funding stream for us to work with you, we can help you better deliver on this mandate. So I think, you know, we all have to be optimistic and look at social infrastructure as being a more blended model between the feds and the province and local government. Um, I don't think any of us are silly enough to think that's going to be easy, but I think we all realize that it's going to have to be uh, three orders of government that typically have not worked together coming together to do this work. And with that, I will turn it over to my, my very well-spoken colleague to understand what your thoughts are. You mean Alina, right? Not me. <laughs> um, <clears throat> thank you so much, uh, Mayor Gondek. And uh, uh, I'm going to pick up on a thread for uh, from there right away, which is uh, how ill-equipped our federalism is to deal with social infrastructure challenges and the, and the social challenges. In fact, the big urban issues of the 21st century. I mean, we have we live in a country uh, with a system of government built for a 19th century agrarian society. Uh, with the legislative and fiscal tools uh, for the challenges of the 19th century. And here we are today in the 21st century uh, with blurred lines of responsibility, with the increased challenge of trying to create political legitimacy in an increasingly polarized, very fragmented uh, public discourse. Um, I had the huge opportunity, uh, Mayor Cam Guthrie's on the call, who's currently the chair of Ontario's big city mayors, and he's doing an incredible job fighting for some of these issues right now. Uh, I had the honor of being his predecessor, and uh, in one of my, my conversations with the Prime Minister about this, I remember saying, you know, we've got this problem, we, we, we're expected to solve these huge social issues in our communities, but we, have, we don't have the tools to do it. Uh, and that's, that's the antiquated federalism that we're in. And he said, well, if you want me to open up the constitution, you're talking to the wrong Trudeau, which was a pretty good line. Um, and I said, but I don't. I actually think what we need is a renewed um, fiscal arrangement uh, and a willingness, just as Mayor Gonduk said, for us to accept that our, our residents and our, our uh, citizens don't care about the fact that there's three and a half or four levels of government. They just see the challenges and they want us to address them. But these are big and complex and intersecting crises. So your question was, what are we seeing on the ground? We are seeing the intersection of a mental health crisis, uh, the opioid and addictions crisis, income polarization, uh, and in our case, an extreme housing uh, rise, a rise in the price of housing. In, in the city of Barrie, the, the price of the average home for purchase this is all, all types of built forms, the average has doubled during COVID. So that two year rise, which is more like 50% if you, if you look across the province, is just an astonishing number that nobody can keep up with. And the economic shock that comes along with it is rise in rent uh, and an incredibly tight supply because there are very, very few apartments to rent. So to, to give you a sense of what's happening on the ground, I just did a radio interview before I came on this webinar to talk with the local radio station about an extra $400,000 in funding that we are giving to our local social service providers who are charities to try and transition homeless individuals out of their COVID model of shelter, which was actually in, in hotels, back into uh, the community. There's nowhere for them to go. The problem, you know, the money will help, uh, and our local fourth level of government, the county of Simcoe, kicked in $800,000. But we as local governments are doing this as a symptom, again, of the problem, which is that 
uh, as the old expression goes, the federal government has the money, the provincial government has the responsibility and the local government has the problems and the expectations that come along with that. Um, I would also echo that it's very difficult to create political will behind either short or long-term solutions when things are so intensely polarized. And I think, you know, we've, we've heard about, we've talked about the pandemic of disinformation. Um, you know, we, we live now in a world where we consume information that is fed to us by algorithms that are driven by sensationalism, right? I mean, the more you are um, driven to click something because it sparks some piece of our lizard brains, uh, the more our phones feed that to us. And so the way in which information is presented has fundamentally changed because of that business model around the algorithms within, let's face it, like three platforms, maybe four or five. That's a shocking sort of worldwide problem, but it's one that we as local politicians and, and, and in fact, anybody who wants to move public opinion or needs public support has to accept. We, we can hate it, but we have to accept it. And so um, what it becomes about to me is how do you build the will behind both the longer term solutions that we've, we've started to talk about and, um, and in fact, even the shorter term problems um, and still make it evidence-based when increasingly people are consuming information that is emotionally based. So that's the, that's the, the uh, magic that I think uh, help seekers and your data can help with. Uh, and your approach can help with, because these are fundamentally emotional issues. I mean, if you can get people up close to some of the social issues rather than removed from them because they're viewing them through their phone or they're viewing them through the comments of friends or, or they live in a suburb and these are only downtown problems they see through their car window. And, um, but if you can get people up a little closer and, and key to that is actually something that uh, the Ontario Minister of Municipal Affairs really believes in. He and I may have some different political stripes, but we agree on this. All homeless services should be per uh, on a by name uh, approach. It is not about case numbers. You need to personalize and talk about the individual uh, examples if if you have to, to try and bring these issues to the uh, awareness and consciousness of of the broader population. Um, there's a lot more uh, I did want to uh, uh, talk about when we have a moment about how we need to shift our investment upstream as the larger, longer term solution. Um, I put something together in Barry uh, through my office called the Barry Health Accord, which is an agreement between our hospital, our police service, the public health unit, and the two levels of local government, the city and, and the county. And the five of us agreed to collaborate on capital planning that would shift investment upstream into the social determinants of health. And what the five of us have in common, other than leadership that generally believes in that, is that we all spend a fortune relatively of our budgets reacting to problems. And the health prevention, community safety and well-being piece of what we do is always uh, the poorer cousin, the small percentage of the budget. And yet enormous opportunity exists in this to try and start addressing the root causes uh, of the mental health crisis, the opioid crisis and, and homelessness in our communities. So again, just like Mayor Gondak, I, I really agree. It's the convening role that is the power and to you mayors on the call, this is your superpower. You can see over the silos, people answer your calls because of the title <laughs> and the fancy chain. Um, but, but that is the convening power. And, and yes, um, you know, we are subject to council. We, at least in Ontario, and I, I believe as well in Alberta, have very little executive authority except in a, a state of emergency. And even then, um, council, you know, councils as a whole spend money, fill programs, uh, establish policy. But mayors do have that unique visibility into our major institutions, into the leadership of social infrastructure into the, the, the service providers who are telling us what they are seeing on the street. And we can bring people together behind some of these upstream solutions. So yes, the, uh, you know, barring changes to our federalism, and I, I do believe we are entering an age in which the federal government will have a greater direct relationship to municipalities financially and in terms of program delivery. And we're seeing that 
particularly through Minister Hussein and the Rapid Housing Initiative and, and related uh, programs. But I, I think um, our role, uh, our, as these expectations increase, as the issues become more complex, uh, our role ultimately as municipal leaders um, will be to, to convene solutions among the providers on a community basis, because that's where you can get up close to the problems. That's where you can personalize the issues, where we are talking about helping our neighbors, not talking about you know supporting something that is in a different part of the country or a different strata or something else. Um, I guess my, my closing thought on that would be um, social infrastructure ultimately is the, is the solution to so many different intersecting again social issues from isolation to to mental health and addictions and so forth and um, I think we're very intentional and we've been built as municipalities to build our hard infrastructure in a very intentional way think of all the master plans Mayor Gonda probably the first thing you did first thing I did was read like 10 master plans because those were the plans there was a fire master plan a parks and rec master plan a, a water master plan a transportation master plan we need those social infrastructure master plans that turn the job of creating human connection into an intentional effort. And in the convening role, you know, you don't want to create a plan that you can't fund or deliver. So um, we have to do a lot of work on the governance side and um, the, the commitment side, whether it's through a health accord, which is what I tried to do locally or another similar tool to build the ability to deliver that infrastructure. But the key piece is to do it evidence-based and intentionally. And, and I really believe in that as being part of the future of our, our municipalities in, in Canada. Thank you. Um, I heard that you went to LSE, Mayor Lemon, is that true? We can, I can tell, I can tell that economics macro thinking is really coming through. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna turn to our, our social scientist, uh, uh, Mayor Gondek and, and ask you um, a question that just came through around your view on uh, the role of Indigenous governments within social infrastructure planning, especially since some of these dynamics are uh, inequitably felt by Indigenous community members on and off reserve. So I wonder if you can take it away from on that one. I can indeed. And I think it's from Ron Bowles, who's from Brandon, Manitoba, my hometown. So hello. Um, I would say that once again, we are in a very interesting position as local governments. We um, are starting to understand a little bit more about um, urban reserves is a conversation that we just had locally about a month ago. And it's interesting because it's not a nation to nation relationship, right? Like there's only one federal nation and there are many First Nations and that's traditionally been the partnership, the relationship and the exchange, but we are the closest to First Nations and I can tell you that our um, partner councils, our neighboring councils are very interested in working with us, but we've got these clunky models that don't let us do it very well. The other problem we have in Calgary, and this is kind of Calgary specific. I don't know if it applies in other places, but because we're a unicity and we have this big massive municipal border, as we are growing into our borders because we annex land, um, it's being viewed that we're sprawling. And that's because we don't have a regional partnership. Like we don't have a greater Toronto area type model. We don't have a lower mainland type model. So um, as we are growing to our edges, we're starting to butt up against um, some of our partners, the Sutina is a great example. They're doing a great land development project. It's called Taza, and there's a lot of commercial components to it, and, and it will be successful. But immediately adjacent to it, we're doing a project called Providence, and right now um, it's being deemed sprawl. That's kind of a problem for us because the folks that are going to work at Taza would love to live close by, and that falls into our borders. So we've got weird ways of looking at things and making decisions that are, are holding up the very pragmatic decisions we need to make to work with um, Indigenous neighbours. I would say the other thing is we're, we're all really good at talking about reconciliation and terrible at taking action. So I'm impressed that our council in November of last year, about a month after we got elected, had some pretty real conversations about what we were going to do to show um, real action. And we invested $11 million into an Indigenous gathering place. 
Um, we are actively speaking with Siksika, as an example, who just had a massive land settlement with the federal government. This council is very interested in ensuring our collective economic success, but we don't have a model. So we're gonna have to create something I can tell you that my regional partners are also interested in doing the same. The Calgary Metropolitan Region Board has met with a couple of our First Nations partners. Um, but again, there's there's no roadmap. There's no like there's no example of how to get this right. So I think many of us are going to have to pilot something and understand that economic benefit has to flow from proper reconciliation. And Mayor Lehman, any response to that or or additional comments? And if, yeah, go ahead. Um, I mean, I think Jody covered a tremendous example there. And, and I think the, you know, the relationship, um, especially when it comes to uh, or the urban indigenous population um, is uh, needs to be much, much more consciously developed in uh, in Ontario. And developed with an indigenous led approach and I uh, you know I think the challenge for many of us as municipalities is our our in Ontario anyway uh, the duty of consultation is poorly understood uh, and so um, you know there's a tendency to do what you know <laughs> and to to use the relationships that that exist uh, and rather than building a more intentional relationship. And I, I guess rather than diving in too much further to that, that's something that I, I know needs to occur in my own community and, and one that I believe needs to occur in many others as well. Thanks. We, uh, we have another question here. Uh, what is the responsibility of municipalities to convene in their cities, but amongst themselves as well to address some of the provincial inequities we see uh, when we look at the data? So I'm not, I'm not sure who wants to take that one or or Jesse, if you have any any thoughts as well. You don't don't have to stay silent on there. You you've got you've seen the data more than anybody else. So please jump in and I can I can fill in for sure. Yeah. So um, say it again, Alina. Just yeah, sure, sure. I, I kind of read it poorly, but responsibility of municipalities to convene within their cities. Uh, so amongst and also amongst themselves, so uh, across other cities to address some of these provincial inequities, what responsibility um, do municipalities have in that regard? Yeah, I mean, constitutionally, almost none. Uh, practically, <laughs> almost all of it. Right. I mean, the the reality is uh, the prevalence of social issues and the expectations of residents who, uh, for whom that is a, a a top top of mind issue let alone the moral responsibility. And this is a piece that is, is harder to sometimes uh, talk about, I think, uh, because it, it, it inevitably involves value judgments and some degree of, of politics. Uh, but it, it's, it is a key piece. I, you know, I think we have a moral uh, uh, obligation to build a more equitable society, to um, uh, strengthen the systems that we have built to support our least fortunate. Uh, and I think we should be judged by how we uh, treat our least fortunate in, in, in our society. So, um, you know, in terms of how to convene or, or, or um, our responsibility to do so, I think we've got it whether we like it or not. <laughs> uh, and, um, but I, th I am motivated because I think it's a, it's, it, uh, it's a moral responsibility, not just one that uh, comes from receiving a lot of calls or emails or advocacy from, uh, from housing advocates or anti-poverty advocates or others. Um, I think, again, we are in a unique position as mayors because we work directly with so many of the on-the-ground service providers. Uh, and that is something that, uh, that provincial government can't do particularly well, even at the local representative level, um, even through department uh, staff. Um, it, it really does require uh, building a structure of collaboration across. So I'll give you a quick example. I mean, if you want to build a straight business case for investing in supportive housing, there are like six or seven Ontario ministries who would benefit from the cost savings that results from successful supportive housing, um, obviously healthcare, but also emergency services, the justice system. There's three ministries there in, in Ontario alone. 
Um, and then there are municipal benefits as well. The emergency services that would receive fewer calls, um, our, our local hospital, even family physicians who um, will be able to have some of that care delivered on site at supportive housing. The problem is you've got to then get all those seven ministries and four different municipal departments to, to cough up those savings in advance, it, it capitalize them, if you will, uh, and deliver them into the form of supportive housing. And that, you know, there's outcomes purchasing and other innovative tools that are designed to try and um, create that. But um, that again is where municipal leadership comes in because some of these are our own departments. And you talked about that blurred line with the province. If you can find some provincial champions who see that across ministries who can say, this is gonna help you and you and you, and we're gonna get somebody from each of them to get behind these projects. Um, ultimately, then you're convening something that, that can deliver the, the value to government on strictly a budget level. On a human level, there's no question about the, the fact that supportive housing is probably the single best thing that we can deliver to address the homelessness crisis. And my last footnote on that is, I thought it was interesting that in some of your data, it's literally the bottom line, as in the lowest uh, number of facilities. That is the solution. And yet it is a tiny, tiny fragment of what we do right now. There's, it's yeah. interesting, we see it also in communities where it doesn't present at all. And then there are provinces when we look at, in Ontario, for example, I'm here in Toronto, massive geographic inequities between North and South. And so, um, and Mayor Gondek, before I continue, I know you have to go soon. So I just wanna give you the, the floor for any closing words. No, finish your thought and then I'll chime in. I do think there's something interesting. I was having a conversation with one of the municipalities, this is in this room. And when we think about mayor's associations and um, the power of mayor's associations and advocating as a group to the province and, and federal government, I think it's important. So one of the things we're seeing when there's unequal rates of social infrastructure growth, that's exponentially creating uh, a demand in these city centers that actually they're not prepared for either. So as soon as you start adding pieces to your social infrastructure, you're going to get people from surrounding communities and rightfully so using that social infrastructure, which creates an acceleration of demand and then often creates this misalignment. So I've, I'm fascinated by the idea of how do we build up social infrastructure at sort of a consistent pace across different communities within a province. And I think that does take again and a broken record here and intentionality in what kind of data we're collecting in municipalities across the province and how we're consistently messaging and using that in conversations with donors, with federal government, with provincial government. I think that something that's interesting here is, um, Jeff, you talked about a moral obligation, and I would equate this to a conversation we just had once again with our fire department. Um, one of my colleagues said, well, why don't you just not respond to the medical calls? How do you feel about that? It was a cheeky question. It was intended to be, you know, provocative. And the chief said, well, we could do that, but then we wouldn't actually be following our oath and we wouldn't be serving the people of the city like we're supposed to. And I think that's how we feel as municipal politicians. Every time someone says, well, housing's not your problem, but yeah, it is. Um, or, you know, healthcare is not your problem. Well, kind of is because it's playing out on my street. So I think it's that sense of obligation, that oath that we took to serve our citizens that's the common bond amongst municipal leaders. And I can tell you when we were together in Regina for Federation of Canadian Municipalities a couple of weeks ago, the conversation around the big city mayor's table was like how much we had in common and how frustrated we were on so many fronts. And we had a couple of federal ministers come in who probably weren't expecting the type of solidarity and you know onslaught that they saw from all of us about things like um, settlement of U Ukrainian um, people that are fleeing a war-torn country. Okay, that's great that the federal government is providing supports, but come and talk to us because we'll tell you what's happening on the ground in our city. Um, we all have the same frustrations with not enough access to um, dollars for supportive housing. We talked about so many things where we are literally cut out of every process and yet it gets dumped on us because the ramifications of not dealing with these things play out on our streets. That's probably the most graphic way to say it. We've been saying it for a long time and now it's for real happening in the street. It's happening in our transit network. So how do we possibly, how do we possibly deal with this? I would say a common refrain is the federal government must establish a ministry that actually understands and focuses on urban issues. 
Like without that, we're all over the place. We have to go to one minister to talk about downtown revitalization, another one to talk about investment in housing, and it's completely inefficient. We need someone who understands that cities are the driver of the economy and that the people who live in cities have very specific needs that are not being properly addressed by the other two orders of government. Nice one. Um, Mayor Lehman, did you want to comment on that? I said a lot before, and I know we we want to bring in some uh, round table, but uh, yeah. here, here, Mayor Gondek, I, I, you know, I think in my role in chairing Ontario's big city mayors, we, we you know, that we really do need to uh, rebuild uh, a federalism for 21st century challenges, whether it's climate change or social issues or otherwise. Um, it will be a more collaborative, uh, and and you know, I remember Adam Vaughan talking about four cornered federalism with fourth corner being indigenous um, communities and, and thinking about our country differently um, at a time when 80% of us live in cities. And um, I really agree with what Mayor Gondar just said uh, uh, around the, the clarion call for change. That's great. We do have some folks. Um, we have Victoria O'Dell and we have, it uh, looks like Sharla Griffiths as well. Um, I don't know, Josie, if anybody wanted to kind of pick up the mic and, and start uh, sharing or if they preferred for us to, to speak to their questions, but uh, I'll I'll start yeah. on this one, Alina, because I think it's a good question as we've wrestled with is how do municipal leaders learn about the social needs of their community? So one of the things we've been doing for years as Help Seeker, but also professionally as individuals is needs assessment. So there's this municipal mandate that everything needs to go through a long multi-year needs assessment where we use StatScan data that came out four years ago and make inferences as to what the social needs are. And we do that every four years as a box checking exercise and those sit on, those sit on the shelves and we've authored ones that have sat on the shelves too. And so that's really pushed us to think, how do we collect data and how do we be more innovative and iterative and how do we constantly collect data and be able to make incremental adjustments to our social infrastructure? And I think part of that certainly is not just uh, how frequently we're collecting data, but who we're collecting it from. And, and when I said invest in technology and you'll be uh, hindered or hampered by your ability to invest in technology that regularly collects data, not only on what you have, but what community needs, part of that is the, the quality of experience that people are experiencing in the social safety net. But if we're not investing in those structures now, and in certain cities that are large already, the amount of technology that's already there that doesn't speak to each other and, and doesn't actually allow municipalities to extract that information to do anything with is a huge challenge. So Victoria, I, I appreciate your question. Oh, please, Mayor Gonda. Just one thing to add on to that. I mean, we, we're notorious for being proprietary with our data too. Like if, if you want someone to cling to something that they don't know what to do with, come and talk to a municipality. I, I don't know why we do this. I don't know why we're so stubborn about um, not sharing information. And you're right. We've got all these technologies in place. Like we've got cameras throughout certain parts of the city to monitor assets and make sure that we know what's happening. Um, but when somebody, you know, someone with a really big tech mind comes to us and says, hey, I could probably harness that data and give you some information on how you can do this or that differently. Then we immediately get the whole, oh, hold on. That's my data, that's not your data. And then we get into all these privacy issues and all of these things. I just think we need to be a lot smarter about the greatest resource we have. And the capital that we're not expending is data. It is the evidence and the information that we need to make smarter decisions that we are not using well. So my quick um, uh, story on that is there's a local web-based, Facebook-based organization of um, storm chasers who predict uh, tornadoes and issue their own warnings to the members in the group. Um, we've had three tornadoes in the city of Barrie in my lifetime. It's a real thing. They came to us and said, can we use your traffic cameras so that we can see storms, especially when they're coming into the city? Nope. Privacy issues. Nope. Yeah, but we prevent, we warn people about tornadoes, you know, tornadoes are really bad. We warn people about tornado. No, privacy issues can't share the feed. You're kidding. And here we go, right? Oh, we could go on. We've, we've had to, you know, put in FOIP requests for some of the data that should be open data. So I, I can so relate, I can so relate. And then we receive it in paper boxes just to make it really hard on us to analyze. So it's it's not just a no, it's also like when we have to do it, it's 
putting all these stumbling blocks. So um, yeah, that what's that attitude about and, and where is it coming from? Because it's, again, it's the 21st century. We're talking about smart cities and smart government and open data. And we're all investing in this technology transition and greener economies. Yet uh, when it comes to these social challenges, there's, again, it's that 18th century mindset. Uh, it's yeah, I think the one issue though, because health data in particular, at least in Ontario, there's, there's a much higher level of privacy and there should be. I mean, let's be fair. We don't want individuals' health records becoming something that can be easily <laughs> distributed or made public. I mean, we, and you do have to be very careful with privacy. Privacy concerns are very real. Um, not when it comes to a traffic camera so much, but it, when it comes to personal health records, right? So one of the challenges, and I think actually there's somebody on this call who's been part of setting up the situation tables across Ontario, you know, they had to come up with a framework to be able to share individual case data for people at high risk to get them the reference to the service they need without tripping privacy concerns. And they did do that. They were very successful in doing that. So it can be done uh, and it should be done because it needs to be done. Um, but uh, but it, it can require a little bit of intentionality. Again, there's that word. Yeah. Well, we're, we're working with several police forces and police forces, when even when we look at situation tables, are referring in many instances into a black box. So when we talk about being able to track outcomes, we have police forces referring the same people to the same organizations every day and seeing them the next day. And, and so we're seeing it um, even in fairly small communities, the, the limitations of, of privacy. Yeah, let's see uh, if there's any other before we go down the privacy rabbit hole, um, which interestingly, there's a lot you can do within privacy, I'll, I'll say that much. And there's a lot of misunderstandings around what can and cannot be done. So for those that are, are looking to work within your bounds, there's actually quite a quite a bit of flexibility there. And uh, privacy experts that we work with are constantly telling us this was not what we intended. We never intended it to create these black boxes. We wanted it to protect people's data, but we wanted it to not become a barrier to getting help either. So um, anyways, there's, there's lots that can be done there. We have uh, some interesting stuff in here about um, the 1988 municipalities, uh, it looks the, oh yeah, so in 1988, municipalities received 4% of tax dollars. This is from Nando. And today we receive about 10%, but we have never been worse off. That's simply because we own 65% of all infrastructure in Canada. We need a new deal with our provincial and federal partners um, slash to upload. So I'll, just to, on this point too, looking at some of the, the media coverage on the recent inflationary pressures municipalities face, and some of this infrastructure, including housing, social housing infrastructure that you're that are on your on the books, uh, the cost of upgrading, the cost of labor, the cost of uh, of maintaining those assets is growing, and uh, and those assets are not necessarily uh, you know returning much in terms of ROI. So wondering what uh, response you might have to that one, Mayor Lehman, or if anybody on the call wants to weigh in on on this point about. Yeah. Capital. I mean, I think the, and a lot of that increase in. Um... You just mute it, sorry. Um, yeah, so the, the federal government getting back into direct transfers um, and uh, to some extent provincial governments um, starting to fund municipal priorities uh, has helped uh, to move that from four to 10 cents. Um, I think the problem though is the service uh, expectations and the challenges uh, associated with them, especially in human services, as we're talking about, uh, have grown much faster than than that. Uh, that 25 year change uh, in the same period of time, the expectations for service delivery have grown so much uh, greater, and the pressures on emergency services from social issues have grown um, so much greater. So. Uh, you know, I think the that my old friend Hazel McCallion used to say the property tax was invented to provide services to property, not to people. And that's true. It was never intended for municipalities to try and fund human services off of a property tax, which is the bulk of our funding in Ontario. Um, so again, there's a whole, you know, when you when it comes to who pays the fragmentation and the the uh, the two issues around um, levels of government or the issues around levels of government it do need to be 
resolved for sure. But I also think there at some point municipalities are going to have to really bite the bullet and and say uh, we cannot um, take on the service responsibility for all human services as well as all of the other infra hard infrastructure services and everything else we we deliver. We are challenged enough uh, with our core mandates, um, both fiscally and in terms of the growing complexity of that work. Uh, and so, you know, in Ontario, the answer to that uh, 15 years ago was the government uploaded social services, both the cost and some of the delivery. Uh, and then some of that started to, to, to come back down. Um, and so again, as the conveners, yes, as the funders or direct service providers, no, it would be a mistake for municipalities even to accept further erosion uh, of those lines. Um, Jesse, any other questions or folks that want to chime in on this? Um, no, I have a comment and agreed of, of privacy kind of going back being a complicated issue. And I agree, private data is is, is Protecting private data is paramount. Where we see it uh, used problematically is it being used and not even from municipalities, but any part of the social infrastructure to, to hoard and, and protect data um, as a reason not to collaborate. And we, we do a ton of privacy work at Hope Seeker Privacy Impact Assessments. And so our sort of bent on it is how do we, how do we use that to further um, collaboration, not use it as a hindrance? So I agree. I would be curious, and, and I'm putting people on the spot, but are there any smaller municipalities represented here who are in the beginning days of the shifting mandate or just starting to build capacity or, or any where this messaging isn't sort of resonating? And feel free not to chime in, but I would love to hear. Well, as you do, I'll just mention, so my part of the world, for those who aren't familiar, is uh, Central Ontario, Simcoe County, uh, Barry's about an hour north of Toronto, and we mix the recreational sort of cottage area with a more urbanized southern area that's that's fairly suburban. So we have everything from uh, kind of small rural townships to uh, us as the major urban center and some very fast growing towns in the south half. Um, traditionally, um, social services and people needing them have migrated to the city of Barrie. Uh, Guelph, Kingston, London, Ontario, Windsor, Ontario, others would be very familiar with this story. Um, that actually has been changing. I'd be interested too to hear from others in other parts of the country. We are starting to hear from the smaller centers around us to say people are coming here and into encampments. They're setting up encampments uh, or they are looking for uh, services uh, and there's a demand for shelter services where there have, hasn't been traditionally. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Kim uh, Wingrove, did you want to speak to this? So Kim, ask your questions, or, or if you're if you're shy, I can I can do it for you as well. Or Heather uh, from Port Hardy. Let's see, let's see if they if they're cool with it. Ah, yes, Kim. Kim would like to uh, to chime in here, Josie, and Heather as well. I will will bring you guys to the to the podium here. All right, okay, uh, Kristen and Kim, you both are on. Maybe let's go with uh, with Kristen first. If you want to unmute and throw your your camera on, if you're comfortable. No, oh. okay. Maybe we'll go with you, Kim, first. While well, she uh, right. sort of. So thank it. you all so very, very much for a wonderful conversation. This is so very timely for the challenges that that we're facing here in gray and I don't think in any way that we're unique but as a um, a rural county our population is just over a hundred thousand people with nine uh, member municipalities and we've had to move in directions that were just totally unanticipated even a few short years ago um, talking to our chief of paramedic services about the huge challenge that we have in human trafficking that that wasn't an issue for us. And we faced this, the opioid crisis, the same as everyone. And your points about the abysmal access to current data are so well taken. And I guess if I had a, a question back to you is, what is the next best step that we can take 
to try and, and move this conversation forward and to get the access to that better information. Because I totally support your idea that good data and convening the right people around the table or all the people around the table is what's going to make a difference. Thank you. Apologies, I, I, I think my internet went down, so I'm happy to see some faces now. It, totally. So I think the next step is I would love to have a conversation with you and, and we are not the end all be all, but I would love to show you sort of what we have access to. And we're doing a lot of interesting work right now. Census data, great, it's table stakes, but how can we look at other novel data sources in a community that you do have access to, or even do some projection modeling to, to, to not fake it, but to fill in some gaps where you're a smaller community that doesn't have that robust data. And so I think depending on what you have available and also what we have available, it's about putting that together and saying, uh, what confidence do we have in this and where are some of the, the signals or gaps or cases we can make for more support. So I think one of the really helpful things, particularly with the robustness of, of our provincial level data across the country is to look at your size community compared to other social infrastructures and communities of a similar size. We can start to make some inferences as, as to the, um, ideal service mix, if you will, depending on where you're at in your um, community growth. The human trafficking one is, a, is an interesting one to hear about. Uh, I was actually chatting with some of the folks, uh, the coalitions that are working on human trafficking as well. And, and that's one where the data that's reported through uh, police forces is so poor, yet we have some of these uh, early warning signs. And so the connection between that and um, you know, highway traffic, for instance, that there's ways that you can model so that you can understand whether that traffic is going to increase and decrease as well. So it's, you don't necessarily need to know every single victim by name in every single circumstance to start thinking about what support system you need in, to be able to respond proactively. Um, Thank you all for those comments. And, and Mayor Lay, I'm, I am totally stealing the social, social infrastructure master plan. Thanks. I love so that. I'd love love to chat with you about it. Kim, Kim, you, you guys, you guys in great, you've got a community paramedicine program. Absolutely. And it's our and, and one of the leading ones, if I remember. Yeah. yeah. And and I found, I mean, we probably learned that from you in Simcoe, uh, but it's it's just been a tremendous program in terms of moving upstream and uh, scheduling visits with people who are frequent callers to refer them to services and get them out of that emergency um uh situation. And I think. I mean, at the county level, paramedics often have um, some organizational and data bandwidth that they haven't used historically that can be used through innovative programs like that. And, and uh, I know you guys are doing great things. And so I, I have a lot of good things to say about Simcoe County's efforts in that regards too, because that's, that's moving upstream. That's taking an emergency service and making it proactive. And that's amazing for paramedics who, instead of having to go out to calls to people who are you know, at the worst moment of their lives, they're actually building relationships with people. So uh, I think that's awesome. Awesome. Uh, Kristen, were you good to go? Or did you want us to go to Heather first? I'm not sure if you're if you're uh, ready to rock here, because just because I don't see your camera on. No? All right, let's let's go to Heather. Cause hi, Heather. Hi. Thank you very much. Actually, I've, I've been waiting patiently for this session to start. Um, Port Hardy is not dissimilar to a lot of the communities, but we're a community of just under four thousand people. We have a service area, of approximately five thousand, and then the northern tip of Vancouver Island is about eleven thousand people. Um, Port Hardy is third. Uh, highest poverty poverty rate in BC, um, and our child poverty rates at about twenty eight percent. And so COVID, uh, pre-COVID, you could buy a home in Port Hardy for like $180,000. Uh, Post-COVID, we're looking at about 580, uh, roughly, for the same type of house. Uh, so we've increased our numbers and the amount of people that are now uh, don't have access to homes, but also the youth uh, on the street have actually increased quite significantly. Where they normally had couches to surf on, uh, they no longer have those couches to surf on. So we're faced with quite a Quite a few challenges and the fact that we didn't take action pre-COVID. Um, we already went into COVID with 150 vacancies in the health sector uh, on the North Island, so we we're already hampered. So I think really what I'm looking for is, you know, some ways to 
you know, put pressure uh, where we need to put pressure because as we only have a very small staff, our resourcing isn't great. Um, our tax base isn't huge. Uh, so we don't have a lot of um, resources to be able to put to this. So we're basically doing this off the side of our desk, which isn't, which isn't helpful. Um, so I'd just be really interested to, you know, of any kind of really great ideas to um, kind of put a little bit of pressure where pressure is needed. <laughs> I, and I don't know if my friends from Revelstoke are on the call. One of our close partners is, is Revelstoke looking at some of the similar data we have. I would love to just maybe offline have a conversation with you about maybe not directly their experience, but some of the ways we've used this data and how we've gotten around the limitations in a small community, what data is available in, in day one or two of this kind of early journey. And um, yeah, I would love to have a further conversation. That'd be great. Thanks, Jesse. Uh, Kristen, are you ready? Let's see if you're ready to rock. Kristen, going once, going twice. Um, she's probably like getting a coffee. <laughs> so let's see. Josie, I think I saw somebody else put their hand up as well. Uh, was it Ron uh, from Manitoba? Ron, did you want to speak to your question? Uh, directly, or we can read it out for you too. Oh, he's up. Uh, you can read it out, that's fine. No, go for it. It's Either from you. Uh, yeah, we're, uh, I just wanted to, uh, you just asked what was happening on the municipality. So I was just more telling the group that, yeah, what's happening in Barrie, what's happening in Calgary um, is, is happening here. So so rural Canada is, is facing all the same struggles and all the same problems. I thank you very much today because I did realize that even though we're having some tough, tough conversations with all the right people in the room, I think we missed the feds. So uh, I'll be working on that. Thank you. Yeah, you betcha. You betcha. Awesome. Well, um, Josie, and if there's somebody else, please put them up. But maybe this is last call. If anybody has any other thoughts or questions, if um, and if not, I I'm super good to uh, let us all go couple minutes, couple minutes early, not not too early, but thank you so much for the discussion. Uh, our two mayor panelists, it's amazing, amazing to have you. I can see, I can see why uh, Jesse insisted on on having you here, Jeff. Uh, you're absolutely uh, excellent speaker and, and really thoughtful. So thank you so much for that. And Mayor Gondig, who's who's uh, my my mayor out of Calgary, just makes me a proud Calgarian to to have that representation at this stage. Thank you to all of you who participated as promised. I'll just I'll just add just sorry just one more thing. Um, this this is my full time job, and so I've been on a road show <laughs> over the past you know six months speaking to many of you, and I uh, would love to continue it because the more we understand sort of your context, the better we can understand how we design products and data and support, and then cross pollinate across the country. So please reach out to me. I'm the one who sent you all those emails, so you can just reply. And I look forward to the conversation and, and echo what Alina said. Thank you so much for your generosity of time. Quick last closing thought to we in, in the municipal sector, uh, we have incredible organizations at both the provincial and federal level for knowledge sharing and information exchange. We by and large don't use them enough. Um, we, we, are, we know we are all facing similar situations and there are innovative programs from all over the country that we can learn from. So if residents ever give you a hard time as an elected official about going to a conference or if senior staff are thinking, yeah, we're gonna cut that budget for training or information sharing or webinars or conferences for staff, don't do it. Um, there's always a nugget or two that you bring home that can be immensely more valuable if all that matters is the sort of return on investment. But in a fragmented sector, the best thing we can do is collaborate. Perfect ways to part. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of your day and uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs>